Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk uh, that uh, is going to be like the first talk in the 47 Degrees Academy that we give publicly in this new academy era that we are relaunching these days. It's a pleasure for me to be part of it, and I hope we have, we have some fun today with functional programming and uh, the topic of this talk that is going to be around handling in the context of concurrent programs and asynchronous computations. Uh, before that, something that I, I think is interesting for you to know is that we are going to have time for questions in the end. So if you have any questions, please write those down and then at the end, you can share them in the Q&A panel uh, in the Zoom webinar. Okay, that's where I will be reading and where I will be answering them. Uh, said that, uh, there is a very cool uh, intro video that I, I, I would want you to watch uh, to kind of get uh, or start diving into the topic we will be talking today. So please enjoy. Resilience. Resilience is the psychological quality that allows humans to be knocked down by adversities and come back just as strong as before. It's tightly linked to failure. This quote by Michael Jordan does a decent job describing resilience. I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Pretty interesting, huh? But along with that example, there are plenty more in human history. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Einstein didn't speak until he was four. His teachers thought he was mentally handicapped and slow. Edison was told he was too stupid to learn anything. Later in life, he was fired twice for not being productive enough. Harrison Ford was told by execs of his first film that he simply didn't have what it takes to be a star. Beethoven was awkward on the violin, and his teachers felt he was hopeless at it and would never succeed. Yet, despite setbacks, failures, and obstacles, they were all able to adapt and succeed. This might also apply well to software development, where the history might not be as epic, but the concept stands. Failure in software teaches engineers to build programs able to understand, control, and be resilient, because resilience is also a matter of adaptation. Every program has a not-so-happy case that needs to be addressed, and this is where our story begins today. All right, pretty cool, huh? So that's uh, how our story is gonna begin today because we are gonna be speaking about or talking about error handling and uh, making our programs resilient when we are in the context of concurrent computations. So let's uh, start diving into content already. If we think about programs nowadays or, uh, you know, they used to have like two different paths that we need to, to account for. There's gonna be a happy path and an error path. So the happy path is the one that we will likely want to follow most of the time and compute over. But at some point, uh, we are gonna also need to account uh, for errors and handle errors. So there's an alternative path, which is the error path that we will need to also take into account, right? So we could see any programs, uh, for example, as a combination of operations that could either uh, go well or fail. So for example, in this program, if uh, the, the computation goes well, we would, be, we would stay in the top track, but if it goes wrong or there's some failure, we would go into the, the down path or the bottom path. So we can, we can understand any programs using this sort of concept, and that's what is uh, publicly known or usually known as uh, railway-oriented programming, which is just a way to call it, uh, to call this way of organizing or you know, composing programs as a composition of functions that could either go well or fail. So this concept of railway-oriented programming appeared uh, first like by Scott Wulaskin in 2013, so it's a quite old post, but it still uh, stands like the concept because it's totally valid nowadays. So it's a blog post that I totally recommend and there are also some slides and a video, so that's probably the best way to consume it. I will share all the links later on. Um, so don't worry too much, I will do it in the, in the Slack channel we got for 47 Degrees Academy. Uh, but it, this is a really interesting talk uh, to watch about this concept. 
So let's say we want to compose a program using different computations that could either go well or go wrong. Let's say we have F2 and F F1 and F2 as two different functions. The first one applies some transformation. The second one does the same. And then we got a successful result, right? That's what we would expect if we stay on the happy path or the happy case. But uh, it can happen like the opposite. If we have these two computations and then we might get an error in one of them, those of them are dependent computations or chain computations. What is going to happen is that we are going to stay in the error track as soon as we get an error. And this happens because we are in the context of a dependent computation or dependent computations. In this sense, what I mean is that uh, you need the result of the first one, F1 in this example, to perform the second one, F2. So if you don't get the result, you, shouldn't, you wouldn't ever be able to, to run the second function, right? So this kind of dependency imposes that as soon as there is an error, we cannot keep computing. So that's why we keep the error on the, on the error track and then forward it right until the end. So there is a code representation of this concept that can also be known as code branching, right? Because we have this duality all the time where there can be a successful result or an error. And uh, the way we encode that into Arrow or using a functional type uses to be either. Okay, so either in Arrow is a zeal class that is defined with, can have like two different implementations, okay? It's left or right, and it has two different type arguments to reflect that. So if it's a left, it's going to contain an error by convention, because we always put the errors on the left-hand side of an either, and then in the right side, we can encode it using nothing, which is the button type, and means that we don't care much about that uh, side of either, because we are computing over the error in this case. For the right side, which represents the happy path in the either or the valid result, we could say in the either data type, we are we're gonna use nothing in the other side, in the left side, because we care about these param type parameter here. And this is cool because this is how we can use the calling type system, both on type, which is nothing, to tell the compiler that when you are evaluating any either instance, uh, type inference is going to work properly without needing any upcast to the upper um, bounds like any or anything like that. It's going to be able to keep both generic types thanks to using nothing in this in this sense because any types are going to fit with nothing because both in it, nothing is the is the bottom it's the bottom type bottom type sorry. So we are leveraging type inference by doing this. Uh, another thing to notice is uh, how either is biased, okay? Either is, and all the data types in functional programming are biased, meaning that uh, the way their operators like map and flat map are encoded uh, are based on the, the happy case, let's say. So in this case, if you have a right or a, that would represent a valid result or a happy path, that's our valid case, that's, that's our happy path and that's where you are going to be able to apply map or flat map. So that's why we say either is biased towards the right side in this case. Meaning that if you want to stack uh, different computations, one on top of another, as soon as those are right or valid, uh, you're going to be able to perform all those computations. But otherwise, the error is going to be automatically forwarded to the next uh, element in the chain. If we have like a chain of either computations, OK? So if we have like a very simple example of how either would work in a successful uh, scenario, we can create a function that returns an either that is going to return either a, you know, a speaker not found error or the actual speaker. We are stabbing the result here just for the sake of the, you know, the example. And we are lifting it into the right uh, side of an either, which means that we are going to make it be wrapped into right, okay? That is because we are representing a successful result of our function here. Uh, we could imagine, for example, this coming from network or a database or something like that. So what we do is wrapping it into either, into write in this case, which is the happy path, and returning the result. So if I run this function, you can see how what we are returning here from the function call is the actual speaker details uh, wrapped into write. In the other hand, if we uh, want to represent the error side, we can lift an error into the left side, okay? This is going to wrap the actual speaker not found error into the left side of either. So that means uh, that when I run it, I am going to get the error wrapped into the left. Okay, that's simple. Probably the simplest uh, use case possible. But what happens if we want to chain operations? So we can use flat map for that. That's why flat map exists, okay? Flat map represents uh, dependent computations or chain computations. 
So we can perform one request and flam up and perform the other. In this case, we are performing a load talks request that I'm declaring right here that is gonna return like a list of talks. And then I lift it as a rank because it's a valid result or a successful result, we could say. So I call the first one in flam map and then can call the second one using a value that is uh, part of the result of the first one because both home computations are dependent, okay? That's uh, how I can run this and the, then get like uh, the list of talks uh, wrapped into write. Okay, that's cool, that works. So far so good, then we can simplify that. If you know a little bit about Arrow and how we are uh, how we are encoding this concept of Mona comprehensions or it's also called do notation in Haskell. You, ha you have some familiarity with it. Um, I think they are also called four comprehensions in, in Scala. So what we got here is a way of representing asynchronous computations as if they were synchronous, right? So this is exactly the same thing we had before with FlatMap. But what we can do is uh, open this either FX block, which is part of the ROFX library for the genetic types we are using. And you can perform one request then bind over it with this exclamation symbol. And we can do this because the operation is returning either. So we bind over it and then we can get the result of the operation assigned to the left hand side, which means that we can use it on the next line, right? Without any sort of indentation or callback style. And then we can call the second computation that also returns either. So we can bind over it, get the result assigned to the left hand side and return. So this is gonna return the same thing. It's the same computation, but it's using this uh, single indentation synchronous like style, right? Which removes a lot of uh, complexity or overhead when we are trying to read it. Cool, so what happens for failing uh, or for errors in this context? We're talking about dependent computations, okay? So if uh, we have uh, three different computations and the first one fails, since the second, the second one requires the result of the first one to perform its work, uh, it's not gonna be able to because there is not a valid result from the previous one. So in that case, you want to fail fast as we were explaining before. So in this case, let's say we perform three different requests, load speaker, load talks, uh, that's gonna use the talk IDs returned on inside of the speaker details from previous request. And then load event, which is going to load uh, the details for each one of the events for each one of the talks, right? So if we get an error on the first one, uh, the second one cannot happen, and then the third one cannot happen. So because all of them are dependent one uh, between you know each other. So what we want to do is failing fast in this context. Here, for example, if the first one failed and returned a speaker no found error, the other two computations will never happen, meaning that the computational cost is totally saved, okay? Because in this sense, you don't really wanna keep computing if it's not possible to compute, okay? So that's what it's gonna happen. So that is for fail fast or the strategy of, of, fa of failing fast. But what happens when you want to actually accumulate errors instead? Uh, there is not a scenario where you can apply that over dependent computations, uh, let's say, because if you have a computation that depends on the previous one and the previous one fails, uh, you cannot perform the second one. So there's not a way for you to get errors on all the computations. You are always gonna get the errors in the first one and then forward those errors right until the end. So if you really want to accumulate errors, uh, it's probably gonna be under the context of independent computation, okay? So in this sense, we can have like a couple of examples, all right? Let's say we have a couple of computations and then uh, both of them could go well in this case. So what I want to do in this case is to gather all results in the end. This happens because most of the, of the time when you are running independent computations, it's in the context of uh, an operation that you want to split into different parts, let's say. And each one of the parts is gonna return one part of the final result, let's say. So you want to gather all results in the end to maybe compose them in a, more advanced business model or something like that that you want to return. But what happens is if you have, uh, let's say in this case, we have three different computations, F1, F2, and F3, and what happens if one or many fail in this, uh, in this context? In this case, for example, name and address are gonna fail. Well, in that case, you can also, or you also want to gather all the, the, the failures together, right? 
So that's why a data type like validated and validated non-empty list exists. And uh, there, it's encoding is like very, very similar to what we saw before with either you get a sealed class that has two different implementation, implementations, valid and invalid. And for valid, you contain the actual valid result. So we are going to uh, use no thing as the bottom type in the invalid side. And for invalid, you contain the error, or you wrap the error, and then you're going to have nothing in the valid side, okay? Because it's, it's the side you don't care about. And then we have this cool type alias, which is, which is validated nail, which stands for a validated with, uh, for a non-empty list of errors and A, okay? So this is the one that is going to be able to accumulate errors, because on the error position, we have an actual non-empty list of errors instead. Validated is biased towards the valid case again, which is the happy case, meaning that it's a map and flat map implementations are going to be biased toward that, towards that case. But if you use it as a, as a validated non-empty list, you have the power of error accumulation. So let's see an example of this. We got this validate talk method here or function that is going to validate a talk. I know there is like a wall of, of code here, but it's going to be like very simple. You'll see in a second. So this talk, if the script is uh, too short, we are going to return a script to short error wrapped into an invalid non empty list. If the script is okay, but it contains some, some ugly words, okay, we want to return an error validates code of conduct error that is going to be wrapped inside of an invalid non empty list again. If the talk is too long, we return a talk, talk too long error as an invalid non empty list one more time. And everything else, so we are going to consider it valid, okay? That's uh, where we will say, okay, our talk is valid, finally. So let's call this function three different times for three different talks. The first one here is going to have like, uh, take like uh, 45 minutes, but the script is like too short. So that's going to return an error. The second one, also 45 minutes, the script is long enough, but it contains some ugly words here. Okay, that's also going to return an error. The third one, the third one is uh, long enough in the script, but it's too long. It's 60 minutes, another error. So the three operations are going to fail here. We want to run them uh, uh, independently, and we want to gather results in the end. And if we have one or many errors, we want to gather all the errors. We are going to use validator for this because each one of the operations are, are going to return validated, as you can see. And then what we want to use is the actual validated applicative instance. Applicative is uh, what we call a type class. We don't need to dive into what a type class is here, but it defines a behavior, okay? And in this case, it's going to be the behaviors of uh, running independent computations. That's why, why we need it in this case, okay? So we want the, valid, the, applica the applic applicative for validated, sorry. And it requires some parameter uh, that is going to define the error accumulation strategy in this case. We use a, a semigroup. Semigroup is another type class that uh, declares how to combine elements. In this case, we are combining errors into an empty list. So we got a validated applicative to run, all, uh, run our independent computations with an error accumulation strategy. Then we call the tuple method from the validated applicative, and then we can run our three computations and go gather results in the end. That's cool. This is something that we could simplify with meta because there is a lot of instances here that we are going to provide a compile time because our own meta provides a set of features and one of them is a compile time implicit uh, resol dependency resolution. So that's something that is going to be automatically resolved at compile time. It will be able to find those instances for you and inject them. So you don't need to worry about those. So you will be able to do it like this, validate the tuple and then run your computations. That's our idea with it. Cool. So if you run something like this, I think this is like in, uh, we need to think, I think. If we run something like this, you're going to get an invalid wrapping all the errors, right? So it's an invalid with a non-empty list with the three different errors we are getting. If you got successful results from all of them, instead what you would get would be a valid containing the actual list of results, which would be the top details for each one of the talks. Okay. That's it. That's what you're going to do if you want to accumulate errors. So we've seen, uh, until now, we've seen how to handle errors uh, when we have dependent computations, how to gather errors or, or accumulate errors if we have uh, independent computations, 
but most of the time when we are operating with this uh, sort of you know functions uh, in our system that can either go well or fail we do it in the context of a background computation meaning that for example we are in our data layer trying to make an network query or accessing a database or something like that and we want to do that in the background or in a coroutine or something so we ensure we are not blocking the color, the color thread and uh, that's pretty common right uh, but data types like either and validated don't ensure support for, don't provide support for concurrency okay so by themselves they cannot uh, support any concurrent uh, behaviors they depend on their context to do that we can imagine different contexts uh, there's a question we will answer in the end, in the end okay so but we can keep writing them during the talk don't, don't don't worry much about that i will read them in the end if you don't mind so the one of the chance the you know the scenarios we can find when we are trying to compute an either computation inside of a, a background thread is when we have like a thread pool actually but this is probably like a very old style thing and uh, we are going to move into something else in the following slides but uh, uh it's uh i mean it's probably the thing that happened in mo the most before the coroutine era where we were all creating thread pools for our programs. And in this case, uh, for example, you can create a fixed thread pool executor using an, a fixed number of thread, threads. So you can use it like this, with this cool Lambda style. Okay, that's fine. To wrap your computation that you wanna run, uh, that you wanna run in one of the threads from the pool. And then this is not so cool because you need to wire results uh, through a callback, okay? So that's not very cool. The callback is gonna receive the result, which is an eigen, and then we can, for example, fold over it to treat uh, both cases. The problem with this is that we are kind of mixing both programming styles, the, the, a couple of pro different programming styles, the uh, synchronous and asynchronous styles together. And that's not really cool. That's why something like coroutines came into place in the beginning, or one of the reasons for those to exist. We wanted to be able to write our asynchronous code as if they were synchronous when you read it so they look more like imperative or something like that so we can do better we can use coroutines to improve this uh, let's uh, say that our either computation is run within a coroutine we just need to add our suspend operator or i would suspend a keyword sorry to flag our function and then we can just run it uh, as is uh, to return our, our result and then we can just uh, handle the result in the next line, do whatever we want to do with it. In this case, we fold over it as we were doing before. Okay, that's cool, that's better. Uh, but there is still a little subtle issue, which is the lag for cancellation. Uh, it is very important to understand this, and we will learn it during the following slides with a cool animation. But when you are uh, using suspend and coroutines, it's not. Uh, the standard library uh, support for suspend doesn't provide support for cancellation by itself. You need something on top of that. And uh, when we talk about collaborative cancellation, for example, in Kotlin, we are talking about calling X coroutines. Okay, that's a library that provides a lot of things and utilities on top of the suspend uh, standard library keyword and continuation support and you know all that stuff and coroutines, like uh, things like cancellation collaborative cancellation and also data types like flow and channel and, and and so on so there's a library a runtime library providing that on top so we would need that here or an alternative library which is kind of the point of uh, the overall point on on this talk another thing or another chance we can uh, uh, we can have here to wrap our uh, operations is to use the functional io data type IU is going to ensure that you can wrap any side effect uh, and make it pure, okay? Which means that it's going to automatically defer it and make it pro protected against any sort of errors, okay? So what we can do is wrap any side effect full computation like we are doing here to load this bigger into IO. And then we can, at some point in our program, the same way, the same way we would do, for example, in a, in a program that is composed using flows or observables or anything like that, at some point you need to subscribe, right? And it's probably gonna be like a single point in your call stack. Uh, we would need to do the same thing here. So we need a point where we are actually gonna perform the unsafe effects or run the IO. And we use these unsafe run functions. In this case, I'm using an async uh, variant of it, so I can get the result as a callback. 
and it, then it's going to be the cancelable variant, which means that I'm going to get a disposable bag that I just need to invoke for cancellation, which uh, means that I got cancellation back thanks to, thanks to I. Okay, that is cool. We didn't have cancellation, we got it. Uh, but either has some issues. I mean, it has some, of course, of pros that we can see like different computations or you can stack computations using IO in a declarative way and pass them around until you decide to run it. Uh, it supports cancellation. Uh, it's a safety environment for side effects. It's rerunnable because we can run it using strategies for rerun it, like retry and repeat with uh, data types that we provide within that this library that you will have a sneak peek on later on. And uh, if we nest either, we keep the rain base. All right, the problem is nesting, right? Because we are nesting different types, different monads, and that doesn't play really well. The reason for this is that uh, we cannot just use IO of A as is. When you use IO of A, of A sorry, uh, you cannot strongly type your errors because uh, it, it supports error handling or provides error handling capabilities, but only over throwable. And if you want to strongly type your throwables uh, or map them into, into strong uh, error types from your domain, for example, you can do it, you can do the mapping, but then as soon as you lift them into, into IO, you are gonna get them back when you need to process them, you're gonna get them back as a throwable. So you're gonna end up performing an unsafe cast somewhere to be able to treat them as, uh, you know, use exhaustive evaluation or something like that. So that's not something we want here. We want to have the chance to strongly, strongly type our errors. That's why we are nesting IO and either. Okay, so let's uh, try to recap a little bit on libraries. I know this animation has a little bit of a small text. I hope I can explain it well, meanwhile. We have the Kotlin standard library, right? And we have some uh, very foundations, uh, you know, keywords or topics inside like coroutine context, uh, the functions to start a coroutine, suspend coroutine, the continuation, which is the way that the coroutines implement this continuation passing style under the hood. You know the compiler is gonna translate uh, that to a callback style using the continuation. And uh, the problem is that it doesn't support cancellation by itself. So it's like a, a series of foundation items that we can use to build our libraries on top of. That's where uh, something that uh, like uh, Codelinks, coroutines come, comes into play, okay? So we say, we could say this standard library is like a foundations library we are building on top of, and then we got libraries like Codelinks, coroutines, or our effects. Okay, we could consider them more like sibling libraries or something like that, because Codelin, Codelin, each one of them is gonna provide some utilities on top of these foundations, Codelin standard library. So for example, if we, if we take an A to what we get with Codelinks, coroutines, we get things like coroutine scope, uh, coroutine dispatcher, uh, things like uh, job and deferred, of course. Also, these constructors for creating coroutines or logic coroutines, launch and async. And then this collaborative can cancellation comes into play with methods or primitives like start coroutine cancellable or suspend cancellable coroutine uh, and so on. And also some data types, okay? They provide flow, channel. All this is working on top of the standard library suspend system. And then for our for arrow effects, uh, what we got is uh, an opinionated, uh, a functionally opinionated uh, approach for this. So we focus on determinism and purity. We also provide dispatchers. We provide fiber and promise. Things like uh, collaborative cancellation are also available thanks to arrow effects, uh, but in a functional way. And we'll uh, have a look to that later on. And also all the functional data types in this case. So we can understand both like more, most likely we could say like sibling libraries or something like that. Not exactly, but they are, can be used to, to write complete programs, right? Both of them are gonna be opinionated towards their own encoding. And in the case of other effects, we are promoting functional programming. So that's how it's gonna be written, promoting all that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, things like determinism and purity and explicitness and I don't know, completion in terms of covering all the possible cases and a lot of different uh, concepts that we find uh, nowadays in functional programming. Right, so we can find an equivalence relation here. If we, if we step back for a second, we got our IO fiber and then our IO can be understood as a suspended computation state that returns either, right? 
because IU is like a safe environment that ensures that your operation is pure, but Suspend already does that in the Kotlin compiler. And it's evaluated or uh, it's a console that compile time. So the compiler is gonna ensure that you can't have any suspended computations that can't run under a safe environment or an environment that is actually prepared to run side effects. So you are not gonna be able to compile that code, code ever, right? So this is a way that the compiler provides uh, built-in for tracking side effects automatically. And we want to leverage that instead of imposing wrappers like IO that might make a lot of sense in other languages that doesn't have this compiler support, but we do have it here and we are gonna use it for sure, okay? So of course the later is gonna be more idiomatic because that's gonna help us to remove one level of uh, nesting of our code bases. We are gonna be able to eliminate all uh, IO wrappers and. Uh, and, and keep going with that. But there's gonna be an issue and it's this lack of cancellation. What can we do without, without that? That's not something we wanna lose, obviously. So that's where a library like ROFX coroutines comes into play. ROFX coroutines is, uh, we could say a fully fledged concurrency framework. So it provides like all the goodies for performing concurrent operations. It provides that suspend DSL, so it works directly on top of suspend functions but it provides the same API surface that we could get with IO. So you get the same functions like part map and uh, bracket case and part tuple, all the computations that uh, you could use with IO, like eval on for switching threads. All is gonna be available here, but this time, instead of having a wrapper or using a wrapper, all those are gonna work over suspended computations instead. So what we are building is a functional system or functional concurrency system on top of the suspend standard library system. We provide cancellation or collaborative cancellation also because all these operators are gonna check for cancellation by themselves. And uh, it removes the need for noisy wrappers and reset, so it's gonna simplify Arrow a lot. That's gonna happen in the following releases. We already got a snapshot of this that you can try that I'm gonna share later on. Uh, and this is gonna be part of the following releases of Arrow because we believe it's gonna simplify a lot of things. Okay, so this equivalence we were talking about, let's see how it looks in code. We got a program that uh, starts being an IO of A and we are gonna move it uh, to be a suspended computation that returns A instead, okay? That's like the translation we wanna do from one to the other. So let's start with the IO version. We get a program that is printing the thread name or getting the, thread, the current thread name. We flag it as suspend because we consider it's a side effect. And we needed to do something like, for example, opening an IOFX block for uh, you know, running a series of uh, sequential computations. And then we are gonna call this get thread name function three different times. We needed to wrap it into IO also. This effect constructor is the same thing that writing the, the IO constructor, okay? It's what it lifts the side effect into the context of IO. And we needed to do that because we wanted to keep it under control because it was a side effect, we want it to be deferred and all those things that you got with IO. And then we told it to run in different, in different contexts, routing contexts. So computation, blocking IO and UI, each one of them. And we need to bind over them to get the result on the left-hand side and then print them also as an effect. There is like a lot of overhead here, mostly cost because we need to wrap all our side effects as IO operations and we cannot just use them as they are. But what if we replace IO by suspend? I mean, we should be able to do this, right? Because if we flag our computations as suspend, that means that they are already uh, protected against by compiler against running uh, under unsafe environment. So these computations are literally gonna already be able to compute uh, under, uh, over the inner value instead of needing any sort of wrapping. So, we can do the same thing we did before but without any wrappers and it's gonna become like much simpler. We remove like a lot of burden, but we keep all the guarantees, okay? And we will talk about that in a second. Uh, following the same approach, we are gonna move from our nested example using IO and either of A and B to a suspended program that returns either or a suspended computation that returns either. Let's start with the IO variant, then we move into the suspend one. We got a fetch user call that returns either an error on the actual user, then a call to process the user with return that returns either an error on the processed user. 
okay, what we want to do is to fetch the user first, and then we want to wrap it as an IO because it's a side effect. That's going to return an IO, an IO of an either. So we want to bind to return only the either on the left hand side. So we start having some issues here, issues here because we got an either, but we are inside an IO FX block. So you cannot really do easy bridging here. You need to do some manual bridging because you are into the context of the IO monad. We could say we can just use bind here for IOs, but we got an either computation here. So we need to manually fold over it and then raise results into IO, which is not cool. And that happens because monads uh, of different types or different monads do not compose well together. You need uh, this, I mean, this under the hood, the hood all these FX block, blocks are automatically translated by our meta compile time to fly map chains. So this is fly map uh, at the end of the day, all these bind operators, that's fly map. So you, can't, you couldn't ever fly map from IO to either or from either to IO. You would need something like a Mona transformer or something like that, but that would be still be a little bit of a burden. So that wouldn't improve uh, things much to be, to be honest. We can do better than that. We can just use suspend to reflect what is a side effect in our program. We flag our functions to fetch and process a user as a suspended computations. And then we can just operate over the inner value or the inner context. As soon as we stay under this safe context that is suspend or that suspend represents. So we can use either assist and then we can use an either FX block or flamma or whatever we wanna do, but it's gonna be only either. Okay, and we can keep that computations in the context of this duality all the time, error or a successful result without any need for uh, additional wrappers. As we were saying before, the guarantees are gonna stay because, uh, I mean, for example, for performance is gonna improve because you don't need any, any additional wrappers. There's not gonna be a runtime loop we need to write by ourselves as we did for IO, for tracking all the steps that the, an IO is going through. Uh, the side effects are still under control because the compiler is prepared for that in Kotlin. It's going to track any calls to suspend code that are outside of a safe uh, context or outside of, uh, let's say, uh, another suspended uh, call or outside of a coroutine context. And it's not going to let you compile those. It's going to tell you, you're trying to run something that is uh, a side effect outside of a controlled environment. So you cannot do it. What about error handling then? Because before we were used to handle errors using these uh, error, uh, handle error operators on IO, for example, but this time we don't, we don't have IO anymore. So you can use methods like either catch, for example, to capture your errors. So you can do either catch and wrap your side effectful computation, and then that's automatically gonna catch any exceptions happening inside, and then you will get an either as a result, okay? With the error, the throwable as an error, uh, or the actual valid result. Okay, that duality. That's cool because thanks to that, you're gonna be able to strongly type your errors. We'll see that in the following slide, okay? All the relevant stuff you can do to process the error side. So for example, you can use either, uh, either conditionally it's uh, very relevant, for example, because you can build an either from a condition. You can get, for example, the speaker age, and if we consider it's a positive, positive int, we are gonna return the actual H on the right side, otherwise an error on the left side, right? So this is a way you have to, based on a condition, lift your operation in the context of either. And even you can use this chance to strongly type your error if you want to, because you have the lambda for that, okay? You're returning it here. But what happens if, uh, if you want to handle both cases, you can use fold, okay? Fold is gonna ensure completion over your, your either, so you ensure that you treat both cases regardless of the one that is taken right now. If it's a left, it's gonna get through the left lambda, otherwise it's gonna get through the right lambda. So this is typically, typically used for managing, uh, you know, for applying side effects after you process an either result. But since you can return a result from fold, you can use it for returning new computations or whatever you wanna do with it. About either cats, uh, to strongly type your uh, errors into your domain layer. Let's say that, for example, you got a, a service to load your speaker that is a side effect for computation that might fail, and then you are going to either catch over it, uh, and that's automatically going to capture all errors, and then you can do map left to strongly type your errors. 
then we can run this and get a result. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of no, a lot of noise. I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay, let's see if this uh, improves. Sorry, sorry for that. So you can use this to strongly type your address. Okay. So the guarantees stay, uh, things like map and flat map uh, are not, uh, are not going to be needed anymore over IO because you uh, are already computing over the inner value, right? So you can stay in the context of I there, we could say, uh, but without leaving this suspend world that keeps you protected against side effects. So in this case, for example, instead of flat mapping an IO wrapping an either, what you can do is use either directly and then use flat map there. Or manual flat map, it's that what you prefer, okay? But you don't need any, any flat map or map over IO. Cancellation, uh, all these operators that we are taking a look at uh, actually implement cancellation by themselves by uh, checking for it uh, automatically as soon as you call them, okay? So you're gonna see some examples of this. Let's say we have some cancel boundary as a la carte cancellation, so you can call it whatever you want. As soon as you call it, like for example, on this way through uh, dummy loop we got here, it's gonna check for cancellation. And if the bounding context or the enclosing context is canceled, it's gonna automatically cancel the, the computation. In this case, it will not keep iterating. So you can use that to, and put that uh, in any arbitrary point on your call stacks to automatically check for cancellation if that's what you need, but you shouldn't need that. Okay, and I'm going to tell you why. If you get, if you want to to use like a background computation that you want to fork, right, and run in a maybe in a specific routine context or something like that, uh, you want to launch your coroutine uh, in a way that automatically automatically wires cancellation to the parent one, right? So you can use fork connected for that, like here. We use fork connected and then service to load, the service to load the speaker. We are wrapping our side effect pool computation, which is a suspended computation. Uh, we are telling it to fork automatically wiring up the cancellation to the parent coroutine. Then you have this fork and forget variant, which does like exactly the opposite. And it's not something we want to promote. I'm using it here just for the example, but this, it does the opposite. So this uh, forks the coroutine, it creates like a coroutine to run your code in the body but uh, it's not going to automatically wire up the cancellation to the parent. So it's kind of like leaking cancellation. That's not something you are going to do usually. I used it here where I'm nesting both on them. So you can see how I can cancel the parent to get the child canceled, okay? Because cancellation goes from parent to children. I cancel the parent, I get all children canceled. There is also arbitrary cancellation through a lambda that you can provide if you want to use this fork scope variant, okay? We always have like the constructor variant and the extension function variants, or you can use either one without any problem. And uh, uh, you can uh, fork scope it, and then you provide a lambda that is gonna use for cancellation. So in this case, the lambda is checking for a promise. So if at some point I, de I decide to, in to complete the actual interruption promise, the fiber is going to get cancelled. Okay, so it's a way to provide a lambda, an arbitrary lambda that I can also pass around that is going to work, let's say, as a disposable of this computation. We call it fork scope because the, your computation is a scope uh, or bounded by that, that cancellation token or lambda you need to pass. About part map n, uh, this is something we would use for parallelizing operations. Let's say we have three different operations to load speakers, load rooms, and load venues. For example, we are using this suspend constructor to, to make them suspended because let's say they are not suspended by default or whatever. Uh, just so you can see, you can also use this builder. And then we are gonna run them using parmapen. So you use uh, parmapen to run the three independent computations and then you can gather result, all results in the end as a callback, okay? That's where you get the, the result of parmap. And then you can combine them and return them as a new model or whatever you want to do. Again, you can cancel the whole thing. So if you cancel the parent, all the children are going to get canceled, always from top to bottom. But also, if you get a failure in one of the children, you're going to get the rest of the siblings canceled. Because if you remember what we explained before in the context of independent computations, when you run independent computations, 
you're usually using this uh, pattern where you want to gather all results in the end because each one of them is going to return a part of a whole result. So if one of them fails, we can consider the other ones also failed. That's why uh, if you get one of them failing, the other ones are going to get automatically canceled in this pattern. There is the part tuple N, we could say overload, which is a version of the part map N, but that works uh, as a suspended computation. So you don't need to use this callback style. You can just uh, run it, part tuple N, to run your three computations, and then re get results uh, uh, as a triple in this case, because it's three results. Then you can use them in the right next line, in the following line. Cancellation works the same way from pattern to, to children. What if we have a list of elements and we want to, let's say, uh, iterate over it or traverse it? Uh, we got a traversable of elements, like in this case, this list of three different uh, integers. Let's say those are valid IDs for events. Something we can do is use part traverse over the list, in this case, then we can provide it. Uh, coding context where we want to run them and we are going to apply one effect for each one of the computations we traverse. Meaning that you are going to get in this case three different parallel operations over the list that are going to use that ID to fetch uh, some event details. Okay, uh, That's uh, part traverse and can cancellation works the same way for this. You cancel part and you get all the, ch the children cancelled. There is this variant where you have a list of actual suspended computations already. Before we have a list of elements and we wanted to apply one effect for each element parallelly, all of them parallelly, and this time we have a list of effects or a list of suspended functions and we want to run all of them parallelly. You can use parse sequence for that, okay? Again, if one of them fails, all of the, the rest of them are gonna get cancelled. If you cancel parent, uh, all the children are also gonna get cancelled. So you can see how we are implemented this uh, concept of cancellation from parent to children uh, over and over because we want to make uh, an API that is familiar regardless of the case, okay? So you can always apply the same patterns regardless of the nature of the operation you are, you are using or you're performing. You can also raise, apply raises for different, uh, for different suspended computations. Let's say you have different tasks that you want to run parallelly and then you just care about one of the results. You can apply raise and for that. So what's gonna happen is that, for example, if you get three different suspended computations as we got here, you can run them using the raise and then you can unfold over the result automatically so you can provide land rest. So they apply depending on the case. The result is always gonna be the winner one and the rest of them are gonna get canceled. Okay, that's how it works. We also get pattern to children cancellation. So I cancel pattern, all the children get canceled. Uh, something about races, uh, an interesting use case, uh, something we've been talking about uh, on how to use them lately and we've been doing in some of our courses and webinars is uh, in Android, for example, that we are used to, uh, you know, bound our, uh, you know, IO tasks uh, to some coroutine context or something like that because we got the life cycle and sometimes we want our tasks to get automatically canceled as soon as the, the life cycle reaches a destroy state or something like that, which means that the view is gone. Some sort of a, a scenario can be handled using races because you can race against the life cycle, right? You can create a computation that checks for the life cycle, then another one that is your IO computation, you can race the two. And then the one that, we, that wins is the one that is gonna take, take place. Uh, there is also this uh, really cool concept on retrying and repeating computations that we mentioned briefly before. That is also part of this Aurora FX uh, coroutines library that is really powerful. So let's say you have a computation that is a side effect. So you wrap it as a suspended computation and you want to retry it uh, using some policy. Uh, we can compose a really complex policy using the scheduled data type we provide for that. So for example, you can create an exponential back off policy starting at 10 milliseconds of uh, back off time. And then that's gonna use a factor that I think it's two by default or something like that, but you can provide your own factor. And every time it recurses or, or every time it iterates, it's gonna be making that grow using that factor, right? 
So here we are creating a policy that is an exponential backoff that is going to be applying that backoff while the output stays under 60 seconds. And then whenever it surpasses the 60 seconds boundary, it's going to apply some spacing. So it's uh, every 60 seconds and then to a maximum of 100 recursions, for example. So these, all these uh, kind of complex, complex uh, policy, we can create it seamlessly using the high uh, level of composition that a schedule provides for creating this. And the good point of this is that if you, if you have very complex policies that you need to apply on your system, uh, you can have them on a single place on your program and easily review them, for example, in a code review. Because it's like a, it's like a box, a wrapped policy that you can pass around and re even reuse for different background computations. So you just need to call retry, pass your policy, and then you can put any suspended computations inside. Okay. So pretty cool. The result is going to be the list of all the talks in this case, for example. And this is going to be like the final thing uh, I'm going to show today. There is much more, uh, but the, there's not going to be time for everything, of course, because it's, it's a very big library. Uh, and it is resource. If we want to, to work with a, a shared resource that we want to protect uh, and to ensure that it gets closed regardless of uh, the context where it's used, like if we are using it in a background thread and regardless of whether while you are using it, uh, it's, it, the coroutine gets canceled or you get an error or anything like that. Let's say you want to safely acquire, use and always release the result. You want to be sure about that, okay? You can use resource for that. You can create a resource, you provide a Lambda for acquiring the resource. In this case, it's opening it, opening a file, sorry. Uh, we give a path for it, and then we provide a Lambda for closing the result. In this case, we are using a method reference. This is a Lambda, okay? For closing the actual resource. So we defined our resource as a, a wrapped element that we can pass around. And at, the, at any point in our program, we can decide to actually run it. And it doesn't matter where you are, you're gonna be sure that the lambda that you provide there for releasing is gonna get called no matter what happens uh, while you use it. And regardless of where you are, okay? So the lambda you provided when you created the resource for releasing it will get called for sure. And we can get sure of that. So in this case, we get the list of resource and then for example, we are gonna path traverse over them because we are gonna apply uh, one effect for each one of them, parallelly, all of them parallelly. So I part traverse on the IO pool. This could be like, it's a dispatcher, so it can be the IO context. And what I'm gonna do, for example, is reading the contents of the file. This is gonna return a list with the contents of all the files, right? I'm going to do, I'm doing it in parallel and that's not gonna be a problem. If anything happens while I'm reading, any of them throws an error or whatever, the lender for release is gonna get called. So it provides a lot of safety and protection against any sort of leaking errors that you could have uh, when you're working with things like databases or files that you really want to close or even streams, things that do you want to, to dispatch or close or to release, we could say, at the end. What about error handling? Okay, we've kind of mentioned this previously, previously but with any of these computations, uh, you will likely used to stay under the happy path, computing like stacking computations on top of the happy path, most likely, all the time. But a point, there's gonna get a point where you're gonna have, need to handle your errors. So at that point, you just need to hold your error handling strategy, you can either catch and uh, get your suspended computations inside, okay? And at that point, you can map, strongly map your errors to the main errors or whatever you want. This applies to all the, uh, the operators we'll be talking about. Okay, also to either validate it and, and everything. There is much more in this library, okay, but it, it would be impossible to talk about everything. There is a stream for reactive streams implementation. There is race pair and race triple circuit breaker to prevent uh, cascading errors in uh, distributed systems, for example, utilities for concurrency, for mutex like concurrent bar, atomic, semaphore, uh, uh, guarantee case, bracket case, even on for threading to choose uh, to jump from different uh, uh, current contexts. So there's tons of things that we could talk about during this talk. 
Uh, that is uh, why Simon and Raul uh, did a very good job on a talk they gave at Collider's. Uh, I think it was like a week ago or something like that, where they covered all this uh, in, in the talk. And they also went over La Rometa, which has a big role in all this also. And it's going to improve uh, Arrow a lot and uh, the encoding of Arrow a lot. Uh, so that talk is there, you can find it on that link on YouTube. We will also share it in the 47 Degrees Academy Slack channel. And you can watch it already. Uh, there is a couple of courses we are going to offer in the Academy, in-depth courses. Of course, the one about adv advanced concurrency using this library we've been showcasing today. So if you're interested on, uh, you know, like writing fully fledged programs, complete programs, uh, from the beginning to the end using this library, apply functional programming, be covered against any side effect full computations or errors, and uh, be covered uh, when it comes to all the concurrency patterns and everything. This is, this is obviously a course that I would recommend. It's gonna be most likely a two days course, so it's gonna be very in depth. And our intention is to go over all the concepts in the library so we can uh, learn how to write complete functional programs using our effects. This library is intended to be the future of functional programming in coding. So we want to make a row simpler because we know uh, it might be not so easy to grasp in the beginning for many people that is, might not be so familiarized with the functional concepts and everything. And that's why libraries like this one are being released, okay? So it's totally recommended. And then there is also a course about Arrow Meta and how to write compiler plugins with Arrow Meta that we are working really hard lately. And that you'll be able to see a lot of things that we are providing with it, like uh, type coercions, uh, in compile time implicit resolution of dependencies. Uh, I don't know, things like refine types to refine the models you use in our domains, for example. Uh, even optics, tons of things that we can write thanks to the power of uh, the compiler plugins you can write with our, with our own meta. So it's providing a cool DSL for that and we are going to offer a, the, an in-depth course for that also. So you can already subscribe to those courses. You have those on the website. Uh, feel free to. I mean, uh, as soon as they have an affordable or acceptable amount of people, we will start uh, preparing those and find the proper dates. Oops, sorry. And that is, uh, sorry, that is uh, pretty much all I have for now. We are gonna jump into questions uh, in a second. Um, I just wanted to say first that this is gonna be a very big effort by 47 Degrees uh, since like a long time ago. Uh, people like Raul and Simon have been proposing this since long ago, but we had some issue with cancellation that we uh, wouldn't uh, figure out until recently uh, when Simon has been able to come up with a really cool encoding to keep cancellation working over suspend and uh, at the same time provide a fully fledged concurrency functional framework working on top of it. So now we've got a really cool encoding for doing it. And this is why we are moving towards this. There is also already a pull request about this new, this new library open and it's gonna be merged pretty soon. As I said, there's already a snapshot you can use and if you have any other doubts, uh, also please feel free to contact us in the calling Lang channels for more specific hours or uh, doubts. Uh, it's been a pleasure to kind of kick off this new uh, 47 Degrees Academy era. And uh, please stay tuned because there's a lot of content, a lot of courses already on the website, a lot of webinars, talks to come that we got already uh, scheduled for summer and even after summer. So we are going to keep this stream of events ongoing as, uh, as much as we can. Uh, so please stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of interesting content. Thanks for attending and bye. Goodbye.